evening. Good evening. Bless you. Thank you for tuning in. started in a few minutes. Give me a second to get myself lined up here. Bless you, son. Thank you for joining. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. It's such a beautiful evening. Been a beautiful day all day. The weather just lovely. Nice day to go down to the lakefront. Amen. Hallelujah. I pray you all had a beautiful day. Those of you who on at this time, I pray that this has been a wonderful day for you. A, a fulfilling day. Even those who had to work today, that you were able to get things accomplished on your job and continue to glorify God in the midst. Amen. All right, we're going to go ahead and get started. I'm just about set here. I had uh, fell asleep um, before the time to come on. So, um, still waking up, but it's okay because God is good. I went to the neurologist today and they did a nerve test where they shock your muscles and shock the fingers and your back and joints just to see if there's any type of nerve damage. And I tell you, that thing is so painful. So when I got home, I was so sore. I had to lay down because um, of the pain is sometimes unbearable. But nevertheless, God's work, you can't lay down on. You got to continue to do God's work unless it's unnecessary. When you just don't have the strength to do it, you have to endure. Regardless of what you go through, you have to keep on enduring. Keep standing on the word of truth because it's the word that gives you the ability and the power to overcome any obstacle, any trial, any test that you encounter in this life. Because many tests are going to come against you as a believer, but you have to continue to keep pressing on anyhow. Keep pressing towards the mark for the prize of high calling God in Christ Jesus. In spite of the circumstances, in spite of the tribulations, in spite of the tests, because there's so much we're going to be tested with in this life, but it's going to prove your faith in God when you have the ability to keep on relying on His strength when your strength becomes weak and begins to fail, yet God's strength is made perfect. Philippians chapter 3, verse 14 Actually, verse 13 and 14 says, Brethren, I count not myself to apprehend it, but this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth into those things which are before. And this is Paul talking to the church at Philippi. He's encouraging them to keep on persevering in spite of what's going on in their life. Keep on persevering. Keep on pre pressing in. Keep on moving forward. Because it doesn't matter what you're going to have happen in your life. you got to keep moving forward. But he says, and I haven't, haven't fully arrived to the things I want to accomplish in this life in Christ. But never let I forget the things, the mistakes, the past failures, all those different things that we have done in our lives. we got to not let those things hinder us from moving forward. But then he says in verse 14, I press toward the mark for the prize of the high call of God in Christ Jesus. So we got a goal we have to set before us every day. And that prize in Christ Jesus. Attaining the eternal glory. To be able to rest in the presence of the Lord forever. So let's go into a word of prayer. And then we get into our lesson tonight. 
Tonight we're going to talk about being born of water. We talked about salvation last week, about salvation, but tonight we want to discuss about being born of water. So, Father, in the name of Jesus, God, I thank you for your presence today. I thank you for your goodness and mercy bestowed upon us. I thank you for your, your healing power, God, flowing in our bodies when our bodies have been afflicted, God, and aches and pain and discomfort, Father, things that sometimes take us for a loop in our life, oh God. But yet, God, we still have this goal set before us, and that's etern to receive eternal Father, the weight of glory that's in the presence of the Lord. We ask you, God, to forgive us for our sins, knowingly, unknowingly, and wash us in the blood of the Lamb. Purify our thoughts and our actions. Let nothing hinder us, O oh God, from coming to you, from receiving from you, from you the revelation, knowledge, the wisdom, the, the truth, O oh God, we need to have from the Word of God that will help change our destiny. Father, give us your heart tonight, O oh God. Give us understanding. Give us enlightenment, revelation, God, from the Word of God that we can apply it to our lives as we walk by faith and not by sight to the promises of your word. In the mighty name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Thank you, Deacon Alice, for joining us tonight. And God bless you. Philippians chapter 3, verse 13 and 14. LaShonda. Amen. Hallelujah. Can you hear me real good tonight? Make sure the volume's turned up on this thing, so make sure we don't have a, a problem hearing. Glory to God. Amen. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Glory to God. But I tell you, and sometimes, you know, when things happen in our lives that we don't expect to happen, we have to keep on press persevering. We have to keep on holding on to God's unchanging hand. Because it gets hard sometimes. It gets, it gets burdensome when your body starts breaking down. I was talking to one of my neighbors earlier, and he said, welcome to getting old. He said, you start getting old, your body starts deteriorating. I said, you got that right. And I said, but the spirit renewed day by day. Amen. Hallelujah. Okay, thank you. Thank you, son. I, I, thank you. Amen. So, in, in our book, we started talking about last week, um, salvation. Salvation brings to mind two things, being taken from the end and placed into another. Salvation in the context means to be rescued from the kingdom of this world, which is the kingdom of darkness, into the to that of the kingdom of the Son, Jesus Christ. So when you know that you're in the kingdom, salvation, if you go to St. John chapter 3, Verse 16, John, John, St. John chapter 3, verse 16. Matter of fact, go up to St. John chapter 3, verse 14. It says, As Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have eternal life. Eternal life. You know, um, when you think about the scripture, this is with reference to Moses in the wilderness. When the children of Israel were so rebellious, there were serpents coming out into the wilderness that were biting the people and they were dying. And so the children of Israel started crying out to Moses and said, Moses, save us, help us, cry out to God. And so when Moses cried out to the Lord, um, what happened is that God told Moses to t make a brazen serpent or bronze serpent. And he says, and put that on a, on a stick and lift it up. And he said, when you lift it up, he said, what's going to happen is whoever looks upon this serpent, he said, they will live. So, so we have to recognize today that even as Moses in Numbers chapter 21, verse 6 through 9, Moses chapter 21, 6 through 9 is where you find that reference. Numbers chapter 21, verse 6 through 9. And you find that encounter concerning the bronze serpent. And when you tell them to take that bronze serpent and lift it up, whoever look upon the serpent, serpent they're going to live. And that's what happened with many of them. They began to look upon the serpent, and true enough, God saved their life. So this is what reference to Christ Jesus back in the time of Moses' day was reference to the future that was going to take place in the New Testament where Christ is going to come along and he's going to bring salvation to all mankind. 
So in verse 16, St. John chapter 3, verse 16, said, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever, that means you and I, believeth in him should not perish but shall have everlasting life. That is so awesome to know that just because we look to Jesus Christ, just like Moses, the bronze serpent, we look to Christ today who was the sacrifice on the cross for our sin and iniquity. It says, but whoever believe in him, and you're talking about believing in death, the burial, and the resurrection, shall not perish but have everlasting life. Verse 17, for God sent not his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. That is so awesome. God loved us so much when he could have destroyed all mankind because of the iniquity and the wickedness, just like when God flooded the earth with the, with the water during Noah's time. When God flooded the whole world, he destroyed the world. You know, one thing about God, God loves us so much. Even in Genesis, in the beginning, when it says, in the beginning, God created heaven and earth, and, and it's earth without form and void, and darkness covered the, was upon the face of the water, and all and, and all the different things it talks about. You know, one thing about that passage of Scripture, is it's reference to when God had destroyed the world before, even after creating the new world, Earth is the earth without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the water. Between one and two was an encounter that took place where God had destroyed the world, you know, because of the sin. And then when God created a new world, now he has new people that he put in the world, Adam and Eve in the garden. Then not only that, it's a whole lot to go into that. I'm not going to get into that tonight. But it's a whole lot of studying to get into that passage of Scripture by itself, Genesis chapter 1, verse 1 and 2. Um, but when you get an understanding that God flooded the earth in Noah's time because of the sin for men, not only did God flood the earth, but God had to repopulate the earth because after the flood, what happened? Noah and his sons and their wives and his family were saved. So God restored, rep replenished repopulated the earth through Noah and his family, and because of that, it was leads us up to the day of salvation that's believing in God that he sent his son into the world, not to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. That world includes even the Muslims. It includes the Buddhists. It includes all types of nationality. It doesn't matter what race you are. This salvation is for whoever that has the heart and the faith to believe that Christ is the Son of God. You can receive salvation. Amen. We talked about this on last week, about salvation, about the great bondage. Uh, since people are in the physical world and the manifestation, operation from the spiritual world takes place in our minds because of the sinful nature. So to be earthly minded, it keeps you alienated from God. It keeps you an enemy of God. But to be spiritually minded, have a revelation of who God is in your life. It saves you from sin. So we, we talked about that on last week. Salvation is the rescue and deliver from the darkness into the light. So remember that. Salvation is the rescue or deliverance from darkness into light. So you got to allow the Spirit of God to flood your heart and your mind by the Spirit to bring you to a revelation of who Christ is in your life. Let the Spirit of God move upon you and give you understanding. Open your eyes to see, according to the Word of God, what God says about you. And when you do that, I guarantee you find yourself living a more fruitful and a freer life in the kingdom of God. The kingdom of this world is of the devil because the enemy is, is, is the power of darkness, and so many different people are, are stuck in this type of kingdom of darkness because they refuse to come to the light of truth. But you have a choice, my brother, my sister, to give your life to Christ, to come to the light of truth, to be set free from the power of the enemy, and, and allow the Spirit of God to transform your mind and your heart to cause you to walk in the freedom that's found in knowing Jesus Christ. Amen. So tonight we want to talk about being born of water, being born of water. 
If you go up to the beginning of St. John chapter 3, it's where it's going to discuss where Jesus had a conversation with one of the Pharisees named Nicodemus. And verse 1, St. John chapter, one, chapter 3, verse 1, it says, There was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. The same came to Jesus by night and said unto him, Rabbi, we know that thou art a teacher from God, for no man can do these miracles that thou doest, except God be with him. So even Nicodemus had a revelation of who God is. He even had a revelation that uh, Jesus Christ was from God. So then he goes on, and he says, Except God be with him. And Jesus answered said to him, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, Except the man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Right? We know the scripture. Many of us read this many years. Even from a child up, we heard about this. Nicodemus said to him, How can a man be born when, uh, born when he is old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered and said unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, Except a man be born of water and of the spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of spirit is spirit. Marvel not that I said unto thee, ye must be born again. So it's very important to get a revelation from the word of God. What Jesus was talking about, Nicodemus didn't get a revelation until he went into deeper in depth of what, it, what he's talking about, about being born again. Nicodemus thinking that in the human standpoint, I gotta go back into the womb again to be born again. That's impossible. So when Jesus brought clarity and revelation understanding to him, then Nicodemus understood what he's talking about. Because he, he even said that, I know that you, you must be from God because no man can do the things that you do. And that's the thing about Jesus, the different miracles and the things that he's done, raising the dead, healing the sick, opening the blind and eyes. People witnessed the different miracles. And he knew that no ordinary person could do these things except God be with them. You have a lot of sorcerers, a lot of witches, a lot of warlocks, will try to mimic the power of God. You have to be aware of the demonic forces that are out here to lure, to, to entice you, to deceive you, to cause you to believe in the darkness of the enemy and the power of the enemy negating the power of God in your life. Only God has the blessings and the promises that he releases in our lives that are, that are, in, that are durable, that will maintain. The enemy, anything the enemy does for you, I guarantee it's gonna, it's gonna be limited. It's gonna be have a limit on it. It's not gonna not gonna last forever. It has a short time period. Before anyone can be born or saved, the gospel is, of salvation is to be preached. The gospel of salvation is the initial message of the kingdom of God to man. However, there's more to the kingdom of, than salvation. Anything. In the kingdom of God is not accessible to the one who is a part who is not part of it. So if you're not born again, all the promises God have in His Word, the initial salvation, you cannot even receive it if you're not going to have faith to be, to be part of God. This is why salvation is first is the first message of the kingdom aimed at rescuing men from the power of darkness into the glory and the liberty of the kingdom of God. Without salvation, whatever the kingdom has to offer is irrelevant to any individual. The preaching of the gospel or the good news of salvation is to inspire faith. Without faith, it is impossible to enter into the kingdom of God. We talked about this last week. I just wanted to recap this again because it's very important to get this principle in your heart. Without faith, it is impossible to even give God glory. It's impossible to even praise God. It's impossible to even come before his presence. The gospel of salvation is aimed at causing a person to ignore his present state, to believe 
in the justification by the standards of God's kingdom. In other words, what this is talking about, the gospel of salvation is the avenue that gives you the understanding of the justification to being acquitted from your sinful nature in the kingdom of God. Without the justification, you're guilty. You're guilty as charged of the sin and iniquity, the mistakes, the shortcomings, the failures. But when justification is taking place by faith, through by the grace of God, by faith, guess what? It's as if you've never done anything wrong. You can go before the judge of darkness and the enemy can't find no accusation against you because you've been acquitted by the blood of the Lamb. The blood paid the, paid the price for your sins that you can be set free from darkness. So because of the kingdom of God that dwells in our heart, Jesus told his disciples, there are going to come many people saying, lo, the kingdom of God is over there, the kingdom of God is over here. But he said, the kingdom of God is within you. And what he's talking about, a lot of people don't understand what the kingdom of God is. That, that'll be a whole nother lesson, but I'll give you a brief, brief synopsis of what it is. The kingdom of God is the governing authority by the spirit of the God that dwells in your heart. So anything that has to do with your well-being in your life is connected to the power and the authority of the kingdom of God. There's the enemy's kingdom, and many people live in the enemy's kingdom because they're still living in a defeated mindset, a bondage mentality, still yoked up, tied up, tangled up in sin, and don't want to be set free. But when you come into the kingdom of God, the kingdom of God, it removes the scales of blindness from your eyes. So you begin to see yourself through the mirror of the word of God. No longer being governed by the things of the world, but now you're being driven by the Spirit of living God to live in righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Ghost. The gospel of salvation is aimed as causing the person to ignore the, his present state. So your present state, you might be a drug addict, might be a, might be an alcoholic, might be a prostitute, might be a pimp. It doesn't matter what your nature is, this state of nature that you're in, the justification has given you the, the right to be set free. The message of the kingdom uh, of Jesus Christ says he has qualified you for the kingdom of God. Jesus qualified you. He gave you the right to enter into the kingdom of God. He gave you the permission. He gave you the authority to approach God's presence. So as a citizen of the kingdom of God, now I'm born by faith in the salvation of Jesus Christ, which entitles me to have the right to come before God anytime I have a need. That's why the word says in Matthew 6, 33, but seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, then all these things should be added unto you. Why? Because the more I get a revelation and understanding of the authority that I have in the kingdom of God, Anything I need, now I can approach God for myself. See, in the Old Testament, when you study the Old Testament, the priest had to offer a sacrifice once a year for the sin of the people. But because of Jesus Christ, we no longer have to go before a priest saying, I need you to make a sacrifice for my sin. Now I'm coming for God for myself. God, I messed up. I made a mistake. I can repent and be born again. That's what the word tells us. Repent and be born again. So I can come before God for myself and receive the true salvation. Boy, hallelujah. Lord, thank you for this pain to be removed in Jesus' name. But, but nevertheless, the more you focus on God and his word, you get it in your heart. Let that word be planted and rooted in your heart. The word begins to produce fruit in your life. Amen. So the message of the kingdom just says that Jesus has qualified you for the kingdom of God. Holding on to this word and ignoring your present state is your ticket into the kingdom. I like that. Holding on to the word and the ticket of knowing you've been qualified, been justified, been set free is the, is the one that gives you entitlement to walk and live and abide in the kingdom of God. That is so good. That is so good. It's like saying to a person, someone has paid your school fees, 
go there and mention his name and your document will be handed over to you. The kingdom of God is of faith and everything in it has to offer is received by faith. The kingdom of God, you have to recognize it by faith. You can't see it with a natural eye. You only see it by the spiritual eye that you are able to buy in this kingdom. It is only those who still hold to the understanding that they have to do something in order to qualify that find it difficult entering to the kingdom. So if you think you got to work to get into the kingdom of God, the only work you got to do is work is to believe. Jesus told his disciple one occasion, he said, one man said, he said, uh, he said, look, master, what must I do to inherit the kingdom of God? He said, only believe. Why? Because when I believe, I can believe that a chair is going to hold me up. I can believe the chair is going to break when I sit in it. Why? Because the operation of faith. Believing is the same as having faith. So if I believe that God is working in my life every day to will and do according to his good pleasure, then by faith, I'm believing that I can be well from sickness. I can have a sound mind from confusion have peace in my heart from worrying. Why? Because I believe. One thing I have to realize, and I always talk about this when I was in a hospital going through cancer, and, and God spoke to me, I can live a worry-free life. I had to believe this. When God spoke that to me, I said, Lord, from this day forward, and this was in December uh, of 15th, 2015, I was lying in the hospital at midnight hour and God spoke to me and said, get a book. The book, he said, God's promised to men. And in that book, he said, you're going to find help to hear the scriptures. I had no clue that was an actual book until I did research on Amazon and found the exact title of the book and found the exact scriptures in the book. And then God said, you can live a worry free life. And from that day forward, I said, Lord, no matter what's going on in my life, I'm not going to worry about it. The good and the bad, I'm not going to worry about it. I'm just going to praise you. I'm going to worship you. I'm going to magnify you. And guess what? I did that. Even to this very day, even after going through the divorce, I went through the, the moments of depression where it tried to get a grip on me. I went and saw a psychiatrist, and I said, Lord, you told me I can live a word-free life. I spoke to the psychiatrist. He had lots of things in my heart. One day, I was right back on track. I said, from that day forward, I'm not going to worry about anything else. And guess what? I don't worry about nothing today because I made a choice, a decision, a decisive decision, an effective decision to not worry about things that's not in my power to change. Some of you out there worrying about something you don't have no power to change. You need to stop worrying. Cast your cares upon the Lord, for he cares for you. And I guarantee when you cast your cares on God, God has the ability and the power to do more for you than what you can do for yourself. He's waiting on you to recognize the kingdom of God that's inside of you and the kingdom authority that dominates the power of the mind of the flesh. When you walk in the spirit, you will not fulfill the desires of the flesh. The flesh is the thing that keeps so many different people in a state of bondage in their mentality. Bondage is a thought. You just don't get in bondage. It's a learned behavior. So if you continue to learn different things that of defeat and failure in your life, it's going to produce it in your life. So you find yourself continually gravitating to negativity, toxic people, Things that are going to destroy you. Why? Because the mindset has been corrupt. Until you get the mind of Christ, you will never, ever find yourself living in the liberty where Christ has made you free. You got to have a willingness. One thing about God, check this out. God ain't going to force you to change your mind. He's not going to change, force you to change your heart. He gives you the choice. Every day when you get up in the morning, what do you do? You make a choice that I'm going to get up out the bed, right? Otherwise, if you're lazy, you're going to just lay there. You make a choice to get up out the bed. Some make the bed up right away. 
Some go to the bathroom, take care of their hygiene. Some go in the kitchen, start cooking first. Whatever your routine habit is that you do, you made a choice. God told Joshua, he said, tell my people, I set before them life and death. Choose life and live. Joshua spoke the exact word to the children of Israel. He said, God set before you life and death. Choose life that you and your descendants will live. Why? Because you have to make a decision, I want to live. There are people who make a decision, they want to die. So every morning they wake up, they're miserable. They're looking for reasons and ways to die. Because they gave up hope. They gave up on life. When you're living in the kingdom of God, you're going to be tested. You're going to be proven. You're going to be tried. You're going to find yourself making mistakes. You're going to mess up sometimes. But it doesn't negate the fact you're in the kingdom of God. Your actions does not negate the kingdom of God from the other in your heart. It's the mindset. Because I can't see myself living in the kingdom of God, then my actions are going to follow suit of the kingdom of darkness. So I have to make a decision in myself that I'm going to live in the kingdom of God. That's why it's very important, my brother and my sister, to be in church somewhere. Be in a Bible-based believing church, not any church, but a Bible, faith-based believing church where you can learn about your identity in Christ Jesus, learn about the salvation message, learn about who you are in Christ Jesus and the life you are able to live in Christ Jesus. Faith is so basic. Faith is so basic. Anyone who can use a coupon or respond to a discount has faith. Like you go to the store. They say, okay, we're giving out coupons today with 50% off. So whatever you find in the store, 50% off. You got faith that you're going to get that 50% off, right? The same way in God. God says, I gave you a ticket of faith. So the ticket of faith is your coupon. It's your discount. You don't even have to work for it. It's free. All you're going to do is receive it. It means you held on to the words of the seller when you receive the message of a coupon or a discount sale. You heard on to the message. You do not receive a discount by your works. Discounts are the works of the seller. And you enjoy them when you, uh, when you act upon receiving the knowledge of them. So if someone gives you a, a discount off of any type of merchandise or any place you go, it's because they work for it. You didn't work for it. But because of the generosity of their heart, they give you the, the right to receive a discount. The message of salvation is the kingdom of God giving you free entry and, and membership. Just like, um, I, you know, I just found out recently, I changed my insurance from one company to another. And because I did that, it entitled me to a free membership to the gym. I'm like, that is so amazing. It's called Silver Sneakers. You get free access to gym memberships any way you choose that's participating in that program and you don't have to pay for it. And that, that's how God's salvation is. Message of salvation is a free gift for, 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 for we're saved by faith <coughs> and not of works by, you know, faith, faith but we're saved by grace, by, by faith. I'm getting my words with it. Excuse me one second. I hate, hate when that happens. But if, <coughs> Let me find this scripture because my mind is just kind of, kind of, uh, okay. Ephesians 2 and 8. For by grace are you saved through faith and not of yourself is a gift of God. That's what I'm trying to say. So once I got my mind straight, I got the word. But it says, for a grace, for by grace are you saved through faith, right? Is that not of yourself? It's the gift from God. So it's free membership, the free entry into the salvation you are entitled to because of the work that was done by Jesus Christ. You didn't work for salvation. You don't deserve salvation. You don't deserve deliverance. But because of Jesus Christ, the seller has given himself to give you the free access to grace, to receive faith and salvation, now you are able to be born again. You act upon receiving the message the same way you respond to discounts. So you act upon the mess receiving the message the same way you receive a discount. 
and that entitles you for all the precious benefits that are in Christ Jesus. Amen. That is so good. That is so good. To those of the law, the good news that is Christ met the full punishment of the law for their freedom. Christ met the full punishment of your, your punishment. When you go before the judge and judge says uh, uh, to the people who are standing there to, to make the decision, the jury says to the jury, did you find, uh, do you all come to the final uh, agreement about the verdict of this individual? And they all says, yes, they're guilty. And the judge said, okay, we, the jury, we find the defendant guilty as charged. So because of the, the 12 jurors made the 12 decisions, all in agreement, you're held guilty. But thank God for the advocate. Hallelujah. The advocate, King Jesus Christ, walked into the courtroom and he stands before God and said, God, sure enough, my client, which is your prosecutor, he said, my client, sure enough, committed the crime. My client, sure enough, did this act of, 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 of injustice. But because of the blood that was shed on the cross, hallelujah, the blood of Jesus Christ paid the price for my client to be set free. And then the judge says, okay, well, we find the defendant innocent of all charges. You're free to go. Jesus Christ stood as the advocate, the intercessor for you and for I in the courtroom of God and said, you know what? The price has been paid on the cross. They've been, they're, they're now entitled to walk free. And guess what? For by grace are you saved through faith. All because of grace came into the courtroom. Grace says, I took it upon myself. The sin and the iniquity, the punishment and the shame, the reproach, the rebellion, the stubbornness, the idolatry. I took it on myself and I nailed it on the cross that they can be set free. That is so awesome. So now you have the right to walk free in Christ Jesus. That is so amazing. In 2 Corinthians chapter 5, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 14 and 15. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 14 and 15. It says, For the love of Christ constraineth us, because we thus judge that if one died for all, then we all were all dead. If one died for all, then we were all dead. And that he died for all, that they which live should not henceforth live unto themselves, but unto him which died for them and rose again. That is so amazing how Christ, he died for you and for me. And the scripture says that when he died, because of the sin nature inside of you and I, it died too. But when he rose again, Hallelujah. We rose to redemption and to the new life that's found in Jesus Christ. That is so amazing. For those no longer under law or even attempting to live by them, their good, the, their good news is, is not in the death of Jesus. It is in the revelant. It is irrelevant to them. The death is irrelevant. It means it doesn't have no value. It doesn't apply to you. It's irrelevant. So if the death is irrelevant to you, guess what? The life of Christ is more relevant to you. So if, he, if Christ died to bring you new life, then guess what? You're no longer dead. You're now a new creature in Christ Jesus. For such people, the good news is that eternal life is come unto them in the person of Jesus Christ. That is so awesome. Glory to God. Jesus is the eternal life of the Father, and the knowledge of Jesus gives us eternal life. The knowledge of Jesus Christ is eternal life. To know him is eternal life. This is not as complex as it seems. 
It's easy to believe. It's easy to attain. You just accept it by faith. Amen? Once you believe, you are cleansed by the washing of the water of the word, which is preached unto you. And that's the message Jesus was telling Nicodemus, that to be born of water means to be washed by the word of God. And the gospel is being preached to you, brings you salvation, that he might sanctify and cleanse it with washing of water by the word. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 26. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 26. That he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of the water by the word. Then he says in St. John chapter 15, verse 3. Now ye are clean through the words that I have spoken unto you. You're cleansed by the word. St. John chapter 15, verse 3. You are cleansed by the word. When the word comes inside of you, the word is like, like tide detergent. that washes your clothes. It washes your soul. Because the word gets in your soul, it gets to wash away all the debris and the filth and the scum of sin that's in your life. And the word begins to sanctify you and set you free from the bondage of sin. Once the message of salvation is believed, it is evidence that's given to, to an individual through their confession. So once you confess with your mouth, believe in your heart that God raised Christ from the dead, you can be born again. Confessing what you believe by hearing the message of salvation is the testimony before the kingdom of God that you are of faith. Your confession is, is a confirmation. It's a confirmation of your belief in the message after hearing the message of salvation that you have faith in God, that you're born again. That's your, your confirmation. When you believe through your confession and the line of the word of God, that Christ died, buried, and rose again for your sin and iniquity, guess what? It gives you the right to every precious promise God has for you because you believe that Christ became the ultimate sacrifice for your sin. And because of that, salvation has now set you free that no matter what other people are doing in this life, I don't have to pattern my life after any other individual. I can avoid toxic people. I can avoid the iniquity and the sins of the world. I can avoid the enticement of the enemy to try and bait me and lure me into a trap. Because now my eyes have become open and I'm flooded with the light to know the hope of the calling of God in my life that I can see what God sees. So when the enemy comes to try to trick me up, the Holy Spirit now lives inside of me, gives me the warning signals to be aware of the tactics of the enemy. That is so good. This testimony is very vital. It is an open confession to the kingdom of God, which you cannot see with the physical eyes. You can't see the kingdom with your physical eyes. You can't see the kingdom of God. You can only know that it's there by faith. And that's what faith does. Faith is the substance of things I cannot see, but it also entitles me to see beyond the natural realm. What God sees, Hebrews 11 and 1, Hebrews 11 and 1. So you got to allow your confession to align with the word of God and allow the spirit of God to give you an understanding of who you are in Christ Jesus. For with a heart but man, man believes unto righteousness and with a mouth confession is made unto salvation because being born of water, and being cleansed by the water of the word is part of the salvation process. You cannot be born again without being washed in the word. You got to be washed in the word. When the word washes you, the word sanctifies you, the word justifies you, the word gives you the power to live in the freedom in Christ Jesus. The confession of faith. It seals the cleansing of the water by the word. The confession of faith. It seals the cleansing by the water of the word. Being born of the spirit. Now I want to talk about being born of the spirit. I'm going to touch this a little bit and then we, we'll continue next week. The Lord says the same. Being born of the spirit. 
This is where a person is actually reborn or born again. Being born of the spirit is where an individual is actually born, reborn or born again. The kingdom of God puts in a new identity on everyone entering into it. You know what I just said? The kingdom of God, it puts inside of you a new identity for any individual that's entering to the kingdom of God. Anyone walking into it by faith is made a son of God. And this is not the gender son. It's, it's for every in the individual, every person is considered a child of God. And it says, and a joint heir with Christ. So Christ is the heir of salvation. And guess what? We're joint heirs with Christ. Because now we're entitled to the same salvation, the new birth, because we're connected by the blood of the Lamb to Christ Jesus. Therefore, we're siblings of Christ. Because he paid the price, he gave birth to a whole new generation through his sacrifice to bring us as children of God. Therefore, we're siblings of Christ. We're heirs and joint heirs with Christ. For this is effected only as one to believe, to be reborn, and, and walk in the kind of spirit of God that Christ has in him, which is the Son of God, Holy Spirit. One has to be reborn as the kind of spirit of his son. No one entering the kingdom as mere men. You cannot enter the kingdom as mere men. It doesn't happen. That means carnal. Mere man means carnal. So if I'm a mere man, I'm walking in carnality. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 50. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 50. Now this I say, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, neither does Corruption inherent in corruption. Flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. If you think by living in the flesh, you're going to enter the kingdom of God, you got it twisted. Because flesh and blood cannot enter the kingdom of God. Neither does corruption or the decaying flesh can inherit incorruptible. The incorruptible is the new nature that's not going to be tainted. It cannot be corrupted by the things of the world. That's what it means, incorrupted. Anything that's corrupt is messed up, is marred, is, is being decayed. But if I'm not corrupt, guess what? I'm made whole. I'm made full. I'm in Christ Jesus. I'm whole. Jesus, knowing this, told his disciples when he was leaving to wait for the promise of the Father. The promise of the Father is sonship by faith, through the Holy Spirit. That's the promise Jesus gave his disciples, and that's the very promise he gives us today. Anyone who received the message of the kingdom or salvation by faith will receive the spirit of sonship. That is so good by the Holy Spirit. So if you receive the spirit of the Holy Spirit, which is of God, you receive the spirit of sonship. Because if you welcome, you embrace, you allow the Holy Spirit to come into your heart. When he comes in, he comes in with change in your life. To change your mentality, to change your attitude, to change your lifestyle, to change your, your, your circle of, of influence, to change the people you allow in your life. Why? Because you cannot allow yourself, the Christ in you, to be victimized by the sin nature of the flesh. And behold, I send the promise of my Father upon you. But tarry ye in, in the city of Jerusalem until ye be endued with power from on high. Jesus told his disciples, when he rose from the dead, he told his disciples, tarry in Jerusalem until you've been endued with the power from a high, which is the Holy Ghost. Luke chapter 24, verse 49. Luke chapter 24, verse 49. When Jesus was raised from the dead, he asked the disciples to wait in Jerusalem for the promise of the Father, which was the Holy Spirit. 
Jesus knew before he left, he told his disciples, he said, I'm not going to leave you comfortless, but I'm going to go to my father. I'm going to pray that he send ye another comforter. See, while he was with them, he was their comforter. He was their confidant. He was their friend. He was their savior while he was with them. But when Jesus died, they lost their confidant. They lost their savior. They lost their friend. And when he died, disciples scattered. But Jesus, after the resurrection, he met up with the disciples on many different occasions to encourage them. God wants to encourage you today, my brother, my sister. You may be going through a, a situation in your life right now where your heart is heavy and you're broken and you're torn. God wants to encourage you tonight that he's your confidant. He's your savior. He's your deliverer. He's your peace of mind. He's your heart fixer. He's your mind regulator. He's the only one that has the ability to endow you with power from on high to comfort your broken heart. And I want to encourage you tonight. No matter what you're going through, let him have it. He can handle it. He died on the cross, took all the sin of the whole world upon himself. Because he knew that we couldn't die for ourselves. And if he knew he didn't pay the price for us, we all were held guilty of sin and iniquity and would have died. But because of the new nature of being born again in Christ Jesus, we have been entitled to receive salvation. That is so awesome. So he told disciples to go in Jerusalem, wait there until the Holy Ghost comes. Then he says in Luke chapter 24, verse 49, he says, Behold, I send the promise of my Father upon you, but tarry in Jerusalem until you are endued with power from our heart. Because he knew in order to get this power, there has to be a desire to want to receive the power. That, that's one thing. It's another point. I'm going to close with this point. The Holy Spirit it's only available to those who have been born again. The Holy Spirit is the only one that lives inside of you to give you the God influence to change your mindset every day. No matter what you go through in this life, the Holy Spirit is there as your comforter. He's now your confidant. He's the one you can cry out to. He's the one you can go and pray to the Father through the Holy Ghost. And the Holy Ghost is the one that intercedes for you before the Father in heaven to answer your heart's cry. So when you cast your cares and your worries, your situations upon the Lord, it's a guarantee God will answer you according to his will. So I want to encourage you. We're going to pick this up on next week. But I encourage you to let it go. You can't carry the weight. You can't carry the pain. Some are still hurting from the loss of loved ones. On Mother's Day, we just celebrated Mother. I, 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 happy Mother to all the mothers who's online as well. You can't carry that by yourself. You need somebody to stand in the gap with you. The Bible tells us as believers in the body of Christ that we are to bear one another's burdens. So fulfill the law of Christ. What was the law of Christ? The law of Christ was to love one another as I have loved you. That was his law he gave to his disciples. He gives us today. Love one another. If you love one another, you bear one another's burdens. And when you bear the burden, doesn't mean you talk about the individual. Doesn't mean you put them down because they're hurting. It means you go with them in sorrow. You encourage them. You help strengthen them. You help them stand on their feet when they feel like fainting and giving up. You let them know everything going to be all right. I'm here with you until you're able to stand on your own. I'm not going to abandon you. I'm going to hold on to you. That's what a true believer does that's born again. So I encourage you tonight. Bear ye one another's burdens. So fulfill, complete the law of Christ. Fulfill means complete. It's done. It's finished. So I finished the work of the law of Christ by the demonstration of the love of Christ that's in my heart towards one another. So 
So Lord God, tonight I thank you for this message, God. I pray that it not fall upon deaf ears, even those who hear this message again after tonight recording, God, that it will help bring conviction to all of our hearts concerning salvation and being born again and being filled with the Holy Spirit. That you come into our hearts, oh God, and change our mindsets, change our attitudes, change our lifestyles. Father, break habits, break addictions, break strongholds. Because we all have something in our life that you're not pleased with, God. We ask tonight, God, that you remove it by the Holy Spirit, God, to purge it out. That we be washed with the water of the word and sanctified by the Holy Spirit. And that you restore us into right standing and right relationship with you through your son. And I thank you, Lord God, in Jesus' name, that it is done. Amen. If you're on tonight and you don't know Jesus as Lord and Savior, I want you to pray this simple prayer with me. Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus, I acknowledge that I'm a sinner. I ask you to forgive me for my sins. Knowingly, unknowingly, I thank you for giving me another chance. Come into my heart and be my Lord and Savior. And I thank you. And I ask now, God, you fill me with the Holy Spirit and with power to be born again and be filled with the power to be a witness for you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. If you prayed that prayer, welcome to the kingdom of God. Welcome to the family of God. Because now you are entitled to all the precious promises. God has spoken his word for you in your life, in your family, in your children, in your children's children that you and your descendants may live because you made a decision to choose the Lord and live. Now you and your descendants can live because now it's up to you to share the good news with your family members to let them know that Jesus Christ loved them as he loved you and brought you to salvation. And they can receive the same gift of salvation that you have received. Amen. So you stay encouraged. Don't allow the enemy to distract you, to deter you from your promise, from the blessed hope that we have in Christ Jesus. In spite of the difficulty, in spite of the pain, in spite of the hurt that we encounter, hold fast to the liberty of Christ that made you free. Don't let the enemy stop you in your track. And also, I want to encourage you to sow a seed into the ministry. Some sow seeds uh, occasionally. I thank you for it. Every seed that you give, it goes back into the ministry. We're um, in the process of, of rebuilding our, our church. We're going to start breaking ground our next year. The Lord says the same. I'm the assistant pastor of Redeemed Faith Fellowship Church. And my pastor is uh, Cornell Anderson. I, I tell you, I love this man of God. I love the ministry. I love the work I'm doing in the ministry. And I, I tell you, it's been such a wonderful journey since I've been here in Milwaukee, serving under this ministry. And I, I tell you, I love the teaching. Whether people sow or they don't sow, God still blesses me. I, I thank God because he's not a man. He should lie, nor a son of man. He needs repentance. But God promises able to perform in our lives. And I tell you, everything, every time I, I pray over a seed that somebody give or I give myself, God in turn blesses me double every single time. I get blessed double because of your generosity and my generosity and our obedience. Because it's not about us. It's about the obedience that God is looking for, for the seeds we sow into the kingdom of God, for the building of his kingdom. I couldn't do these teachings without God providing the resources to get to keep the internet going or the phone going, you know, or getting the materials to teach. But I thank God for those who have sown throughout the last few years into the ministry. And I pray you continue to sow. Because when you sow, guess what? You're going to reap a harvest of blessings in return if you faint not. That's what the word says. The Lord says if you sow sparingly, you reap sparingly. But if you sow bountifully, you reap in abundance. And that's the true principle. And not only that, but when you trust God, it doesn't matter the amount of the seed. Because the widow in the Bible, she came to offer her arms for the Lord. And the Pharisee and the scribe came. Jesus looked and said to his disciples, who gave the most among the scribes and Pharisees? And, it's, and they said, the widow. He, he, they said the scribes and Pharisees. But Jesus said, no, it's the widow because she only had two mites and she gave all that she had from her heart. You know what? That's what God does. When you give from your heart, my brother, my sister, God gives back to you. 
And that's a guaranteed promise he has in his word for you. When you give, it'll come back to you. Good measures, pressed down, shaken together, and running over. Shall men give into your bosom. So in other words, we help each other when we give. We give to each other. That's what God says. And I thank God for you all tonight for your participation. Good to see a lot of you on tonight. My brother Eric, God bless you, my friend. I'll call you later. You stay encouraged. You know, because God loves us. He loves us all the same. I want you to know that no matter what you're going through in this life, you can make it. I know you can with Jesus on your side. You stay encouraged. Stay excited about Jesus. And keep it, stay in the word. Stay in your word. Get that word inside of you. The word gives you that hope and that reassurance that you can stand on the promise of God's word and make it through trials and tests and tribulation and come out victoriously. And I thank you again for joining tonight. The Lord said the same. We'll resume again next week. Continue the same lesson about being born of the spirit. And I tell you, I love it. I love it. I love it. Shalom. May the peace of God rest upon you. May the Lord be, bless you. May the Lord turn his face towards you. May the Lord bless you and give you peace. Until we meet again, God bless. God bless you, son. Amen. Amen. Have a good night, everybody. Have a good night. God bless you all.